your hands together. Come on. Yeah. Uh, morning, everybody. Thanks for being here today. What an honor and what a joy it is uh, for us to gather as a family, uh, our Louisville campus, our Prosper campus, and our Dallas campus. Will you help me welcome all our campuses? Thanks so much for being here. Woo! <clears throat> let, me, let me give you just some uh, church-wide uh, announcements. Number one, I want to I wanna thank Dallas. Last week, Dallas uh, hit their highest number ever, as well as Louisville, both of those campuses. Uh, will you help me applaud them? Great job, Dallas. Great job, Louisville. Excellent, excellent, excellent job. Uh, let me tell you why that's significant, because you don't realize something. Uh, there is not another church where a black man is preaching in the Metroplex, and it's being done by video, and you have 3,000 people watching. So I want to thank you for being the first to pull that off and to set the model for other churches to follow. I want to thank each one of you for coming and for hanging out at all our campuses, knowing that you have a shepherd there that will love you, shepherd, support, and fight for you right where you are. One more time, everybody. Everybody. Let's hear it. OCC. Woo! Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And then lastly, to our Louisville campus, we're very proud of you. I know you're getting your little student building, not little, you're getting your student building built, and it's costing a whole lot of money, and we're not asking nobody for no money. We're just paying for it cash. Come on. Let's give it up for God for his generosity toward us. Great job. All right. Enough of that. Let's get to the word because we got a word today. Uh, Father, will you help us now? Uh, remove all distractions so we can hear from you. I pray for every single married couple here today, every single person here today. I pray that you will fill us and inspire us with your word so that we can live wisely and make God-honoring decisions in Jesus' name. Everybody said... <clears throat> Amen. Last night, by the way, and Friday night, we had two incredible experiences, one for singles and, and young adults and one for couples. And I'm telling you, ain't no party better than an OCC party. Because if you're a couple and you're here last night, oh, you had some fun. You laughed till your belly hurt as well as you danced with your boo. And if you're there the night before with the young adults and singles, they uh, almost became a club. But it was all godly. It was all <laughs> God honoring, the lights were a little too low, but apart from that, God was glorified in that place. <laughs> Praise God. I'm just proud of us. Here's why. Here's our vision. Because we create environments, listen, where the unchurched loves to attend. Last night, anybody could come in here and just feel like, these church people ain't weird. They're not cray cray. They're not standoffish. They actually are regular human beings. And that happened because of your desire to create an environment where unchurched people love to attend. Here's the rest of it. And church people are fully devoted to God, insiders, and outsiders. Last night, I promise you, made our leadership team so proud because you invited your non-Christian friends and they weren't offended at nothing. Nothing. And that's okay. Bring them back. They might be offended today. But last night, they weren't. <clears throat> All right. I'm done. Um, uh, uh, please stand, Judges chapter 16. We're in Judges chapter 14 last week. This week we're in Judges chapter 16. We have a long way to go, so here we go. <clears throat> in chapter 16, you're going to find Samson doing what, most, what a lot of people do, which is he looks for love in all the wrong places. Looking for love online. <clears throat> Looking for love in the club. Looking for love everywhere else but in church. Ha! Come, you'll see. I don't make scripture up. It's there for you. Something wrong? Oh, Lord, something wrong. What's wrong? Anyways, we're going to read. Let's go. Uh, remember what I said Samson means? Samson means light. Come on, everybody. Samson means light. light. And in verse 4, he's going to find a girl, and her name is going to be Delilah. And Delilah means the extinguisher. So you have light, and you have the extinguisher. He don't know, but she's going to extinguish his light. Because he looked for love in all the wrong places. Some of you shining bright right now. But because you're looking for love in all the wrong places, oh, there's, there's, there's a dude waiting for you, sister. And his only job is to extinguish your light. So keep looking in them places. This side is drawing me. <laughs> Here we go. 
You read it with me, everybody. Now, that's not everybody. Touch somebody beside you and say, we read in church. We read in church. We read in church. Everybody reads, okay? I got to make sure you read the Bible at least once a week. So here we go. Here we go. Everybody together. Now, Samson went to and so. See, you miss it. Last week, you remember I told you, when you see something shocking, you, you're supposed to say, what the heck is he hanging out with Harless for? And why did he went into her? What, what you doing, dude? So let's read it again. Remember, when they first started the Bible, there was no Bible everywhere, Bible on your phone, Bible app, all that. It was just they had to hear it. And when they heard it, it was dramatized because they were like, oh, you're not supposed to do that. Oh, you're not supposed to do that. So come on, here we go. It's like saying, and, 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 uh, and, and, uh, and Keisha went to the club and found him there. You would say, oh, that's right. Same thing, same thing. Contemporary version. Here we go. Here we go. Read it now. Now. There it is. Now you know Hebrew. That's Hebrew right there. That's Hebrew. Next verse, second, verse two, verse two, verse two. Here we go. First of all, last, well, last time we caught him in Timnah, mountaintop range. Hanging out with a girl, got married, married lasted one day. Now he goes to Gaza to find another. What is he doing with the Philistines? God told you don't hang out with them. He says don't hang out with somebody that's not a Christian. You still, you still try to hang out. He says, don't hang out with somebody that says, I'm spiritual. He says, don't hang out with somebody that says, yeah, I believe in a higher power. Don't hang out with somebody that says, I just believe in God. What I want to know is, do you believe in Jesus? Because my Bible says, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess, not God, that Jesus Christ is Lord. Uh-huh. So, so quit hanging out where they call him God. Or they call him Buddha. Or they call him something else. Here we go. Your turn. When it was saying, Samson has come here. They surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night long, the gate of the city. And they kept silent all night. So you got it, 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 you got it. So you go to the club or you go online and there's some dude just waiting there all night for you to go click, like, or swipe up or whatever you do. I don't know what you do. Whatever you do. And he's just waiting there all night. And his only desire, her only desire is to extinguish your light. To convince you that God ain't real. And that you don't need to follow no guidelines or no rule or no Bible. And you don't even realize what you're headed into. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Verse 3. We're getting there. Verse 3. Here we go. Now light. No, say light. Every time you see Sam, say light. Now light. Lay. Do you see the play on words in Hebrew now? It's very cool, isn't it? Now light. Lay until. Anyways. And at. the city gate and the two poles and pull them up along with the bars. Then he put them on his shoulders and carried them to, to the top of the mountain, which opposite. He's on a mountain range. <clears throat> They're trying to kill him. He said, I'm not going to wait till morning. I'm going to get up early and I'm going to take the bus because I'm going to destroy all of you. Next verse, next verse, next verse. Here we go, next verse. After, doom, doom. No, 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 no. The music starts to play now. Doom, doom. Doom, doom, doom. Doom, 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 doom. After this, it came about. Stop. Please say in Israel. Please. Does the rest of the Bible say he loved the woman in Israel? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. He went down to the valley. He's on the mount. Timna, Gaza. Now he went to the valley, and there he falls in love. In lo at least so he thought, falls in love. Here's why he falls in love, because she's fine. <laughs> so, he, so here's what you need to say. He falls in preference. 
He loves his preferences. There's a certain type that he likes. Ha! Huh? Fellas, quit being silent on me. There's a certain type that's your type. You know your type. I don't have to describe it. Somebody complained last week that I went too graphic. Someone stay in my bounds today. Uh, actually, not somebody. About 15 people complained. Anyways, it's fine. They don't bother me. Uh, uh, but, but there's a type Samson likes. And the type showed up. And he says, I love it. Don't care about God's purpose for his life. Don't care about God's mission for his life. Don't care about what God's called him to do. He just felt, fell in love. Where did he fall in love? Isn't it ironic? In the valley of Sorek Valley. What you doing on there, buddy? Stay in the land where God's called you. That's where he is. And what was her name? The extinguisher. Say it with me. Uh, and whose name was the extinguisher. One more time. Whose name was the To which you will say, I can see what's going to happen. You can play the movie, can't you? If he's light and she's the extinguisher, somewhere in the future, this extinguisher is going to take the light out. You see how you can see this clearly? I want you to see just as clearly in your own life. When there, you are the light and a knucklehead or a cray-cray lady is going to take you out. You may be seated. Come on, let's get to it. Let's get to it. Let's get to it. Let's get to it. Ah. Ladies and gentlemen, last week, here's all we said. Last week we said, uh, in the, we describe what happens in dating. What happens in dating is somebody is auditioning. That's what they're doing. They're putting, they want you to see their best self. They want you to see the best side of them. They're putting their best foot forward. They're trying to convince you that they're a cool person and that you should spend the rest of your life with them. That's what they're trying. Or that they're trying to get in bed with you, one of the two. But they're trying to make you know that they are putting their best self forward and that they are a good person. And if you're naive, you will buy their best self. You won't ask any more questions. What we suggested was the reason they're doing that is because they're trying to hide who they really are. Some people do it intentionally, and some people don't even realize because they don't even know who they really are themselves because they've never stopped long enough to ask and discover who they really are. So now that self is being hidden, and the only way you can expose who that self is is by you remaining curious. If you don't remain curious, you're going to stop at, they look good, they got a job, they got money, they got, you're going to stop at the, the surface level and you won't go any deeper. This is big. I'm begging you to see this. Because what we get to see is when you crash and burn in the counseling office. That's what we get to see. We get to see when kids say, where's my dad? When, when, when girls say, where's my mom? Why are, you, why are you not together anymore? That's what we get to see. And you will never blame yourself. You're going to always blame the person for what they did. And you won't blame yourself for the fact that you just ran across the red light and just went into this relationship because you cared so much about your preferences and not about God's purpose for you. That's why this is so big, man. It really is. Think four generations. Play the movie like, like uh, Delilah and Sam. Play it all the way down and say, I cannot do that. I cannot enter this thing so, so casually because the stakes are too high. The only reason, I've said this a hundred times, the only reason we have a, a marriage problem is because we have a dating problem. You fix the dating problem, we'll fix the marriage problem. Because you get into this thing thinking it's all about you. When God's saying it's all about the other person. If you ain't willing to serve them for the rest of your days, then don't get married. So anyway, so, so, so the only thing you have to do, the thing you have to do is to become curious. Which means you need to learn to ask questions that will discover who this person really is. Uh, you got to be careful. Let me take a little shot real quick early in the sermon. Half of you are going to get mad. So yesterday, yesterday you know, we, we had this, this uh, 18,000 people went to this Oprah deal. It was great. Everybody, woo, 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 woo. And for the, if it was seven hours, for the first six and a half hours, she talked about God but never Jesus. And most people are like, oh, my head was so spiritual. Okay, that's fine. But you need to think critically because God ain't enough because you don't know who she talking about. So be careful when you go agreeing, 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 agreeing. 
Now, at the end, she told a story about Jesus and her and the family and all that. But you just got to make sure when somebody say God, you know who they're talking about. Because unlike Oprah says, all roads don't lead to heaven. Yeah. Let me help you out. You can get mad at me. Oh, well, you hating on Oprah? Why you hating? Because my job is to expose and to highlight truth. Whether you like it or not. Whether you like the person or not. <clears throat> so, so I gave some, 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 some people came and we, um, um, they, they went. And, and, and I, had to, I had to talk to them afterwards about, hey, 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 hey. And here's what I'm practicing. Curiosity. Tell me what you thought about it. Oh, it was great. It was intentional. It was purposeful. It was good. I mean, a lot of the stuff you talk about. I said, no, 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 no. But tell me, how, how did you talk about God and higher power? And they said, well, she really didn't say it till the end. She said in a story with her mom, she said, Jesus. And I said, that's why I want you to be able to think critically. Just because somebody sounds good, say good things, don't mean they're talking about the same God you serve. Ain't nobody hating on him. I'm not hating on Oprah. I'm trying to get you to think critically so you can know whether Oprah's God is your God. Because just because she does Super Soul Sunday don't mean that's church. All right, that's enough. Half of y'all walk out. Send me an email. I can take it. Um, um, but the reason why you need to be curious is because you need to be inquisitive to make sure you're talking about the same thing. So when a dude roll up or a girl roll up and she said, well, I'm just spiritual. What, is that? what the heck does that mean? Spiritual. In this age, you got to know that. Because if you don't, you will get married and you will find out that spirituality means two different things. So now you got to raise your kid going to meditation on Sunday or going to church on Sunday. And now you have conflict before you even start. Do you see what I'm saying? So anyways, you got to figure out who that person is. Now, let me tell you even why this is more important. Don't miss this. Because part of the challenge is, I'm going to give you four words. They're not in your notes. I'm going to give you four words I want you to write down. They're not in your notes. It starts with, everybody wants to be loved. 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 They want to be fully known and fully loved. Uh, Genesis calls it, want to be naked and unashamed. That's where everybody wants to be. But you cannot get there. Listen to me. You can't get there unless you're accepted. You got to be accepted fully. But the only way you're going to be accepted is if they know who you really are. Because if you put your best foot, listen, if you put your best foot forward and they don't know who you really are, then they're accepting not you, but only a quarter of you. Which means you can never be fully loved the way you want to be loved because they don't know the full you. The sad part is some of you don't know the full you because you've never stopped long enough to evaluate who the heck you are. Nobody need to tell you you talk too much. You're supposed to know you talk too much. <laughs> Anybody need to tell me you're a control freak? You're supposed to know your control, everything you got to control. Nobody got to tell you you love to interrupt everybody else when they talk. You're supposed to know that. <laughs> Anyways, uh, let's keep going. Um, so you got to be loved. Then you got to be seen. You got to be able to be seen into me. Somebody has to be able to see the real you fully. And the only way they can do that is if they know the truth about you. So if they don't know the truth, then you can't be seen. If you can't be seen, then you can't be accepted. Can't be accepted, then you can't be really loved. The beautiful thing about God is God knows the truth about you. He's seen who you really are. He has accepted you 100%, which is why he can love you unconditionally. But people don't want to talk about that when you get to that. You can't get here fully loved unless you know the truth. Which is why when we talk about intimacy later on in this series, I'm going to show you the seven levels of intimacy and why most people, they have, uh, I can say this, they, got, they have sex but they don't have intimacy. And most men don't have a clue because sex is such a driver, they don't know what intimacy really is. You can't get intimacy without seeing into the person and without accepting the person without all their flaws and without loving them unconditionally. Uh-huh. Which is why. Now, couples, sit up, and let me tell you something. Go to the front part of your, your handout. 
And you'll see, you'll see um, four things. We're going to talk about this later. But I'm teeing this up as a basis to show singles how they need to live. Here we go. Listen, couples. <clears throat> this is a 4D marriage. This is, what, this is the four-dimensional. Some people have one-dimensional marriage. Some people have two-dimensional marriage. Some people have three-dimensional marriage. And some people have four-dimensional marriage. You need to have a four-dimensional marriage. <clears throat> one is physical. One is uh, intellectual. One is emotional. One is spiritual. But you must have all four. Now, singles, now you listen. You must know where you're going so that you know the right questions to ask, so that you know whether or not the girl is capable of having a four-dimensional marriage. Because you're going to be frustrated in the middle of this deal because you want to have a four-dimensional marriage and they just want to have a one-dimensional marriage. Uh Uh-huh. Because so many of you get mad and say, well, we can't go to the next level. Well, you should have known that starting out. But because you weren't asking the right questions, you can't experience all God has for you in marriage because all you care about was preferences, not purpose. You know what I'm talking about. You care about preferences. How they look, what kind of job they got. They have a house or apartment. They got two parents or one. Which, uh, that's all preferences. What I want to know is, do you know God's purpose for you? And do, you, do they know God's purpose for them? And when the two purposes come together, can we see what God had in mind when he brought us together? Because if you get married, people, listen up. I'm going, you wait till next week. Next week, anyways, you wait till next Anyway, uh, when God brings you together, he's bringing two people, he ordained before the foundation of the world, to come together on purpose for him to get glory out of your life. That's why the Bible, every married person should be able to say this. Come magnify the Lord with me and let us worship him together. Every married person should be able to say that. And if you can't say that, then you didn't ask the right questions. When you got mad, because you got mad for preferences, you didn't get mad for preference. Here we go. Here's all four of them. Number one is dating. Whoa, let's talk about this. For the, you, don't, you don't marry to date, you date to marry. See, too many people want to want, get her and, 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 and figure, you want to, I said that the wrong way. You want to marry so that you get the privilege of dating her. Too many people follow the world strategy, and so you want to date her to see if you should marry her. Listen, when you're dating somebody, the Bible, oh, please, let me come down a little closer. The Bible only know of two relationships. Every person you date, fellas, they're either your sister or your, ma- or your wife. Amen. Everyone. That's why you can't sleep with her until you get married. Because while you're sleeping with your sister, you gross, nasty person. Why is this important? Because the Bible don't know an individual that's not in the body of Christ. So if you're in the body of Christ, she's your sister. So therefore, that's why you ought to ask the person when they break up with somebody, you ought to ask them, hey, tell me how you treated your sister in the Lord. Which is why if you just slept with her, treat her like trash and left her, then that's your sister in the Lord, Joker. What you do? That's why she should have a better report about you having dated her than when you didn't. Why? Because you're supposed to treat her like a royalty because she's your sister. And when she leaves the relationship, she's still your sister. By the way, fellas, that's why when you marry her, she's still your sister. That's why you can't touch her. You can't hit her. You can't do nothing stupid because she's still your sister in the Lord. That's why you don't just divorce like nothing. It's still your sister in the Lord. So if she's your sister in the Lord, then treat her like she's a body, the body of the body of Christ. That's why when most people divorce, they got to leave the church. You know why they got to leave the church? Because they didn't treat each other like brothers and sisters. So now you want, you want God when he's convenient, but when you are to live out what love looks like, you don't want God no more. Because she's supposed to be your sister, sir. So don't treat your sister. Don't kick your sister. Don't smash. Don't, what you doing? You're supposed to love her like it's your sister in the Lord. Ladies, treat him like he's your brother. I, I, I need to stay pure. Let's go. So you're dating. Ladies and gentlemen, single people, when you're married, this is what you're supposed to do for the rest of your life. Date. 
the rest of your life. And date don't mean you have a business meeting to talk about how much money you spend. Date means you go out and you just have fun. That's what you're supposed to do. That's why. Listen, listen. If he can't date you and leave you alone, then what you doing with him? That's an alarm. If you can't date him and don't have sex with him at the end of it, that means when you get married, listen to me, every time he takes you somewhere, he wants it to end in him, uh, I want to say smash, but that's not good, having sex with you. So I'm going to get an email about that. I'm sorry. (laughs) Hey, y'all, they put the next one. They said, move on to the next one. Move on. Let's move on. Let's move. She's your sister. That's the only point, right? Here. She's your sister in the Lord. So treat her that way. Number two, then you ought to be dreaming together. Listen, intellectually, you ought to be dreaming together. But you can only be dreaming if you know your purpose is. Somebody came to me last time, oh, Pastor, what do you mean I must know my purpose? Well, well where the Bible said that? Well, he called, he called Adam and he gave Adam his purpose before he brought Eve. So you must know what God's called to do. By the way, she's your helpmate. So what's she going to help you with if you don't have no purpose? But that's not the problem. The problem is you have ladies out here accepting dudes without no purpose and then telling them, I'm going to give you your purpose, then I'm going to help you do it. No wonder the dude walking around with his head like, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. Because you told him what his purpose. God didn't talk to him. You talked to him. That's how we know his purpose. So you tell him, here's what you should be dreaming about. Here's what you should. Shut up. I mean, be quiet sometimes. But what, what, what are you dreaming about professionally? Where are you all headed professionally? The next one is, then you got to be discerning, discovering your fears, your flaws, your friends. you got to discover this. Listen, ooh, I could talk about this for a long time. The reason you need to discover this is because if they don't know, then you're going to discover it together. And if you discover it together and you don't like it, Lord have mercy on your soul. But you need to know their fears. You need to discover. You need to dream together. And then discipling. You need to be discipling. You need to live on mission for the glory of God. Spiritual. This is discipling. Spiritual. And then this is emotional. Then this is intellectual. And then this is physical. That's what we're doing. That's the 4D marriage. But most people only live one of these. Or they live two of these but only with the financial. Or they live three of these, but they never talk. They talk about fantasies. Uh Uh-huh. Let's talk about fantasies. What are you fantasizing about? Let's let's explore that. But they never talk about flaws and fears. Uh, 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 Discipline, but they don't know how to pour their lives into somebody else. Which means you're so self-centered, your marriage exists only for you, but not for anybody else. And part of the challenge with that is if, you don't, if your marriage don't exist for somebody else, no wonder you keep fighting each other. Because you think that's all there is. It's just two of y'all. When God's called you for something so much bigger than just two of y'all. So what are you doing together for the glory of God? Because you have to have a dream. So the reason why a lot of people fight in marriage is because they don't have a bigger purpose outside of themselves. So because they don't face the real enemy, the devil, they face each other as the enemy. So they keep fighting this way because they have nothing bigger to go after. All right, all right. That's, that's all a setup for where I'm going. That's preamble. Even though it's almost time. Here we go. Um, and I'm not taking this to a third week. We're done today. We're done it. So here we go. Uh, go. Open your page. Open the page. Open the page. Go to the middle. Go to the middle wheel that you see there. And then let's talk about it for a minute. Samson was not thinking about dreaming. He wasn't thinking about dating. He wasn't thinking about discovering. He wasn't thinking about discipling. The only thing Samson thought about was his preference. He didn't care about purpose. That makes sense, everybody? Don't make that mistake, please. Don't make that mistake. All right, here we go. God wanted something unique for Samson. But Samson wanted what everybody else had. Don't miss this, ladies and gentlemen. Let me say it one more time. God wanted something very unique for Samson. Very unique. But Samson was satisfied with what everybody else had. We try to live like everyone else when God wants us to live like no one else. Say that with me twice. We try, I'm going to say it one more time. Hold on. We try, to live, we try to live like everyone else when God has called us to live like no one else. Say it with me now. We try to live like everyone else 
when God has called us to live like no one else. Last time, we try to live like everyone else when God has called us to live like. <clears throat> hey, Israel, I don't want you to have a king. I want to be your king. Israel, no, God, I want to live like everyone else. I know you've called us to live like no one else, but I want to live like everyone else. Hey, 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 uh, Samson, I want you to be separate. I want you to be different. I want you to be called out. I, I know, God, but I want to get my wife from the Philistines. I want to get her from there. I want to live like everyone else. Just choose whoever you want. I don't want to live like no one else. Hey, 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 one OCC family, I want you to date like no one else. No, God, I want to date like everyone else. So here's what we do. We go after kisses. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, Lord. Give me some of them big kisses. Yeah, Lord. Give me some of them big kisses. This is what everybody else goes after. You go after kisses. Ah, ah, well, I can't. I just said I shouldn't do any of that. Um, we go after this stuff. That's what we go after. We go after that. Now, no, God's called you to live at a whole nother level. He called you to go after the gold stuff. He got, this is what I've called you and separated you to do. But you, ooh, but God, look how that look big and, and juicy. I want this. I want this. This is what everyone else does. God says, I'm calling you to live like no one else. Because the stuff I have for you is way more valuable than the stuff they get. But you keep settling for silver when God wants to offer you gold. In your dating, I need you to remember, you're not, don't get satisfied with silver, when God's saying, can you just wait until I set the gold up for you? This is what happens all the time, ladies and gentlemen. Every single day, you're going after it for yourself instead of waiting for God to provide what he desires to provide for you. Here we go. So what I'm going to give you now is seven. It's uh, 12. I, I gave you four last week, so I'm going to continue, and then, I'm, and then I'm done. Here are the signs that tell you, here we go now, whether you have uh, red light Green light or yellow light. This is huge. Red light. Ladies and gentlemen, in your dating relationship, can you please stop running by the red light and ending in marital accidents, please? Can you quit running by the red light? Can you wait till God give you the green light so you can know that this is God's best for you? Can you quit waiting and, and can you keep waiting and wait till the green light show up? When the red light is on, that means don't go forward. So let me give you the signs that you got a red light. And let me give you the signs that you got a green light. So let's just go green. This, when you do these, then you got a green light. Number one. By the way, we're not talking about perfection here, but we're talking about becoming these. And listen, and you don't, you, listen, listen, you don't determine if, there, if anybody else is becoming these. You're responsible for you becoming these, and then you're responsible for your community to help you identify if this young lady or this young man is becoming this. This is why I'm telling you, because what I get in my office and what all our counselors get is when people run the red light and there's an accident, and now they have to deal with it for the rest of their lives. That's what we do. So what we're trying to help you with is, here's how you know you got a green light. Number one, Jesus is your best friend. No, no, this sounds simple, don't it? But most people miss this. Uh, I asked the office the other day, I said, some, some of our young adults and singles in our office, I said, hey, um, the first question you need to ask somebody is to explain the gospel. Tell them, explain the gospel of Jesus Christ. They said, that's too much. That's too much. I said, no, no, no. If he don't know the gospel or she don't know the gospel, that means they're going to look to you to fill them. Because God hasn't filled them yet. You got to know the implications of the gospel. It changes everything. So I said, you need to know, you need to make sure that for you, Jesus is your best friend. Pastor, how do I know if Jesus is my best friend? I spend unhurried time with him and I give him undivided attention. That's how you know. So it looks like this. It looks like you being willing to go by your bed every morning you get up. You don't go to Instagram first. You go by your bed. You say, yes, Lord. And you're spending time with Jesus in the morning. And I don't care how you do it, but unhurried time with God is what you're after. This is how you know coming to church don't mean Jesus is your best friend. 
Being spiritual don't mean Jesus is your best friend. Uh, meditating don't mean Jesus is your best Going to yoga don't mean Jesus is your best friend. That, yoga means you're trying to lose some weight and you're trying to focus. What Jesus is your best friend means, you are on the side of your bed, knees down, Bible open, spending time with Jesus. Have you ever seen, have you ever gone, singles, young adults, have you ever gone to, uh, to a restaurant and say to them, table for one, please? Table for one. And you go and you be like, oh, thank you, Lord. Table for one. Oh, and you enjoy the steak by yourself. It's so good. You be like, oh. Everybody around you be kissing each other and doing everything else. And you'll be like, shoot, listen, I just love this steak right here. And you'll be eating up a storm and you love it being by yourself. Let me explain something to you. Don't miss this. If you can't spend time by the side of the bed, in your closet by yourself, if this makes you uncomfortable, then you'll never do that. This is huge. This is so huge. If you can't do this, then that's why when you go to the restaurant, you be like, ooh, I'm going to feel uncomfortable. You're, re you're revealing to yourself that you're not whole. You're revealing to yourself that there's something about you that you don't like and you don't want to be, you don't want people to look at you funny. Look at me. That's what you need to say. Look at me because I live the preferred life. You live the problematic life. You, got, you just, do, let me, okay, let me show you how I know. <clears throat> Do you know how much uh, dating relationships and people who are trying to get something make, you know how much money they spend on Valentine's Day? They're not married. This is not married people. You know how much money they spend on Valentine's Day? $700 trying to impress somebody to get some. Oh, you heard me right. <laughs> Do you know how much the average the married couple pay? $50. Yes. Yes. We part of the problem. Because you set up this young lady in the dating phase, then she thinks she's going to get 700 every single year for Valentine's, another 700 for Christmas, another 700 for her birthday, another 700. That means we don't have no money. We broke. Uh-huh. That's why, listen, listen, when you see all of them people around you, when they go to dinner and all that, think about just, just enjoy you and praise God. Every time you see a couple, listen, don't clap. Every time you see a couple, you need to say, thank you, Lord, for the freedom I have in Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for I know not what their troubles are. Thank you, Lord. See, 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 laugh. okay, let me tell you one of my troubles. Don't laugh. I'm sharing my story. <clears throat> so, um. One of, the, one of the singles came over to her house the other day, and she saw some um, floss. Jada over there talking about, mm. <laughs> Anyways, she saw some floss, some floss. There are about seven of them that has been used on the counter. So she said, is this what y'all married people have to deal with? You got to, somebody left them floss? I said, yeah, I left them. <laughs> So I said, no, it gets worse. I said, it gets worse because when I go to bed to lie down, that's when I stop. So now you're hearing sound. <laughs> Don't look at Jada, look at me. <clears throat> and she don't like it. <laughs> See, don't have your own church over there, Jada. Don't have your own church over there. JDB campuses, JDB having their own church over there. Don't, don't, don't follow that. Anyway, my point is, my point is, my point is, my point is, my point is. That's the problem she got to face. You don't have to face that. You know your own, you can flop. All you want by yourself, ain't nobody picking. You can leave it right in the bed beside you. Jada went in the bed yesterday. She'd be like, what are these floss sticks doing here? I'm saying, all right, I'm going to get better, boo. I'm going to get better. Just pray for me. Here's all I'm trying to tell you. Here's all I'm trying to You don't know the problems you got to face. So you better count your blessings every single day. Because you got the preferred life, we got the problematic life. By the way, that's all Bible. I ain't making nothing up. That's all Bible. Here's my point. Jesus better be your best friend. Because sometimes all Jada can do is go to her closet and say, No, Lord, either take him or transform him. 
<laughs> Sometimes you spend a little too long on take him. But every now and again, she's a transport. <laughs> come on, come on, come on, come on. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Come on. Number two, I talked about it already. Purity leads the, leads the way to clarity. You know that. Number three, uh, know, your, know and live in your purpose. That's number three. Know and live in your purpose. That's number three. In other words, don't get married for preferences. Get married for purpose. Make sure you know the purpose that God's calling you together to go do and not just preferences because after a while in marriage, preferences change. Number four. The next one says, you ought to actively work on your financial health. Talk about that already. Just follow give, save, spend, and you'll be fine. Do not spend, spend, spend. It's give, say, that's the Bible. That's your system for following the Bible. This is how you know you're heading in the direction of a, of a marital green light. All right, number five. Let's stop right here. This is where I want to stop. Here we go. Woo, I got to go. Um, uh, you need to handle conflict biblically. Now, let's, let's talk about this. You must ask the question, show me how they dealt with conflict in your house. When you were growing up, how did your parents deal with conflict? <clears throat> All marriage is, is a series of conflicts and how you solve them. That's all it is. It's, you, you're going to get a conflict, you're going to resolve it. Get a conflict, resolve it. Here's what some people do in marriage, because this is all they saw. They keep a file cabinet of wrongs. <laughs> and fellas, I promise you, as God is my witness, every lady in here can tell you the date, the time, and the hour. You acted a plum fool. It was Valentine's Day 44 years ago <clears throat> when your mama came over when we were supposed to. But they can't, their minds work that way. It's like a computer. You take about three, three of them little dots. Got it. And they can recall it perfectly. <clears throat> well, my Bible says love holds no records of wrong. So if they have not learned how to overlook an offense or to deal with an offense, then you're going to be in marital hell because they're going to recall it and they will not forget the stuff that you have done. Or they, They're going to forget what they do, but they won't forget the stuff you've done. <clears throat> That's why I need to know. By the way, by the way, most church people don't know how to deal with conflict biblically. So let me show you. Okay, go to the back of your page. Go to the back of your page. Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, first, you need to glorify God. What does that mean? That means all conflict starts with God. No matter what happens here, I'm going to give you glory in the middle of this. All conflict starts with glorifying God. What does that mean? God, the basis of me even having this discussion is that you forgave me of everything when I deserved nothing. That's how it starts. If you don't start with grace and mercy, you're not biblical, which is why you need to know the gospel because the gospel drives everything. The gospel says when you were the, the most worst, wickedest person on the planet, God still loved you and forgave you. So since you're starting there, then no matter what they do, you can't overcome it. But if you don't start there, then you can't overcome it. Because it's called the emptiness syndrome. The emptiness syndrome means you need somebody else to fill you up for the rest of your life. So now you're walking around saying, fill me up, 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 fill me up. And you have marriages that are, that are in problems today and that are depressed today because the individual don't know how to fill themselves up by spending time with Jesus. So they expect the other person to walk around all day long, pour into me, pour into me, pour into me, pour into me. And that's what you have when people want to throw in the towel so that you don't pour into me enough. Well, no, baby, no, dude, you need Jesus to pour into you because that person is not Jesus. They're a human being. Anyways, so that's where you start with glorifying God. Then number two, you get the log out of your own eye, no matter what the issue is. You say, what part of this is my issue? And you get the log out of your own eye first. Then number two, you get on to, okay, let's go and show your brother his or her faults. Remember, it's your brother and your sister then your husband. So go and show them your, their flaws. You, after you look in your eyes, take the log out of your own eye, own your stuff, then you show them. After you show them, then you go and be reconciled. If they don't want to reconcile, then you bring the body of Christ in there and you bring somebody else. That's why you must live in community so you can bring other people in when the other person is being unreasonable. 
And then, this is all Bible, y'all. Everything I'm saying is about. Then you go prepare, be prepared for unreasonable people. Because your spouse going, this might be a hot button for them. And you need to be prepared to be, for them to be unreasonable. And when they are, then you come back again. Let me glorify God. Because this is about you, not about me. Listen, the goal in, in, uh, in, uh, in forgiveness and handling conflict is not success. The goal is obedience. What does that mean, Pastor? That means you don't, everybody don't have to be happy at the end. Everybody must just walk in obedience at the end. The goal is, did I, did I, did I establish that I'm trying to glorify God? Did I get the log out of my own eye? Did I go and show my brother his faults? Did I go and try and be reconciled? Did I bring somebody else, Matthew 18? Was I prepared for unreasonable people? Let me start the whole cycle over again. But when you don't have this and all you have in churches is, the, is people who grew up in homes that it was all about themselves, then you have people for years talking about, well, well, you better do it my way or else you ain't getting none tonight. And you weaponize stuff. Really sex, but I'm trying to tone it down this week. You weaponize it because you don't know how to handle conflict. I ain't cooking for you no more. You weaponize it. You ain't getting no money. You weaponize it because you don't know how to handle conflict. Number five. Come on, let's go. Number six. Oof. I can spend all day in this. You are whole and not trying to be a savior. You are, say this word to me, everybody together, and not trying to be a savior. Well, we got is too many people that are trying to be saviors. What does it mean when I say you're whole? When you lack wholeness, you're, you have instability. Listen, when you lack wholeness, you have instability. Now you want somebody to fill you and do what only God can do. When you're instable, you have instability. Listen, here's the danger. Then you attract instability. So now the girl have to tell you that you're a good dude because you don't believe it when God told you at the side of your bed. <clears throat> now you have the guy defining who you are. Oh, yeah, girl, you fine. The next time he looks at you, he says, oh, girl, you better put on some makeup. You look, you look tore up. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> girl, you better go get this. You better go get that. Now he's telling you what good looking looks like. So now you go get everything added to yourself. Because you don't believe in who God's called you to be. Because you thought, when God says you're fearfully and wonderfully made, you thought it was a mistake that you don't get the body part that you need. So you're going to go at it because a dude told you you should add it. What's wrong with y'all? That's because you went whole. You went sitting at your bed praising Jesus and spending time with your best friend. So now you need somebody else to affirm who you are. Let me explain something else to you. So then you're going to need a savior. So he has to tell you how beautiful you are for you to feel good. You, do you know the cycle that goes down? You finna be depressed. Because depending on how he or she comes home, you finna, okay, who do I have coming home? Do I have Mr. Nice Guy or do I have Mr. Bad Guy? Is he going to chew me out? Or did I cook? Okay, is that good? Is, that good? is it all right? Okay, okay, do I have the right gown on? Do I have, do, what kind of life is that? I thought you existed to bless them and they existed to bless you. Not for you to meet their every desire and want and need. Uh-huh. Anyway, let's go. I don't have no time for that. Let's move on. Um, the next one is, ooh, you're, you're in ruthless pursuit of the fruit of the Spirit. You're in ruthless pursuit. Uh, next week, you're going to have a handout that gives you the nine fruit of the Spirit and nine dating options to explore each of the fruit of the Spirit. It's going to be great. So now you have nine, every week for the next nine weeks, you can take your wife out or you can take your husband out with an emphasis on one of these fruit of the Spirit. That's what makes people love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So here we go now. So if he can't handle his money because he spends too much, it means he doesn't have the fruit of the Spirit called self-control. If he don't have it, it's going to show up again later on. If she can't stop spending resources, it's going to show up later on. You're teeing yourself up for a conflict. If they can't control themselves sexually, they're telling you, I don't have this fruit of the Spirit. You are co-signing on it, and you think it's cool until when you get married, and he says, no, I can't deal with one girl. I need another. No, you don't like it. When you were sinning and you were in favor, you were cool. 
when he's sinning and you're not in favor, now you want to throw a Bible, you start throwing Bible up front because it would have addressed the real issue. Oh, somebody need to say preach right there. <laughs> no, he can't say preach because you're, Lord have mercy, that's what's happening. Lord have mercy. I didn't realize it. Yeah, no self-control with you means no self-control with anybody else after you married. Uh-huh. Anyways, let's go. Um, you ought to live in community. I ain't going to talk about that. Everybody know you ought to live in community, not in isolation. The next one is I wanna, I, we need to manage. I manage my moods and know how my history impacts my future. I can manage my moods. Somebody say manage my moods. One more time. Manage my moods. That's why when you see the person get angry and you see them show their anger and you think, well, I know how to calm him down. Okay. <laughs> this happens every day in relationships. You see their moods and you give it a pass. And say, so, well, with me, I think God's brought, this is my purpose, to help him not get angry. That's why you need somebody in your mind to say, what's wrong with you? Are you that desperate? The only reason you're attracted to that is because you're instable. And so your instability attracts all the instability. And you'll let him do whatever. People do it all the time. Oh, yeah, we're going to move in because it just seems reasonable and he loves me and I love him. Oh, oh, okay, no problem. You just exhibited the lack of self-control. You just exhibited the fact that you cannot control yourself. So therefore, when it you love it because it's in your favor. But when it turns... And it's no longer in your favor. You're not going to love it. And that's when you're going to want to become spiritual. And I'm telling you, in that moment, you don't need spirituality because you overlooked it before. So you don't manage your mood. Too many people get manipulated by that. Most of us are manipulated by our moods. The only way to help and guard your moods, the only way to help your moods is to guard your mind. And then number two, you need to make sure you, re you affirm God's word. Let me explain. People get, when people get depressed, it's because they're thinking depressive thoughts. Whatever you think, you will feel. Whatever you feel, you will do. So therefore, if you want to change and you want to be happy, then you have to think on the Word of God and the thoughts that tell you about who you are. And then you will begin to feel what you think. And then you can live out how you feel, which is driven by how you think. So part of the issue is when you get mad, it's because you have a thought that you are focusing on. So in couples, whenever they get somebody and something, you remember I talked last week about something that makes your skin crawl? It's because you don't know yet how to not focus on that for the rest of your life. That's why every time they do it, instead of focusing on the many things you do have, you focus on the one thing they're doing. And because you are, now you're bent out of shape, which is why you started with God's word. And you say, God, I'm going to take a thought from your word, and I'm going to throw it into the bucket of my thoughts. And the more rocks of God's word you throw in the bucket of your thoughts, the more the water comes out, and the more God's word gets in, and it shapes how you think so you can manage your moods. It's a big deal. And most couples live in that state because they don't know how to manage their moods. Let's keep going. Um, how to be a cheerleader. And a protector and a provider. You need to know how to be a cheerleader. Ladies, ladies, know how to be a cheerleader. Men, know how to be a protector and a provider. Ladies, know how to be a cheerleader. If you've never seen your mama be a cheerleader, then go to a mentor and say, teach me how to be a cheerleader. <clears throat> Ain't nothing like, uh, I think it was last week. There's nothing, nothing, nothing like driving home. Last week this happened to me. Driving home. And out came Jada and them two kids, and all of them are dancing because I showed up. I said, that's what I'm talking about. Do that. <laughs> no joke. I, the garage went up. All three of them came out. They had a whole routine. I'm like, that's what I'm talking about. I show up, and I get some cheerleaders. That's what I'm talking about. And she's teaching her daughter real good. Yeah, when daddy show up, you train, you train them to, to do that dance. The next thing I need to get them is some pom-poms. But everything else was good. They were like, <laughs> give me a C. C, you got your C, you got your. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Every man in this house is supposed to say, preach, pastor. 
Be careful. Some of this takes time. Don't demand it. <laughs> Don't demand it. Calm down. Anyways, but, but just as you want her to be a cheerleader and pump you up, you got to know how to be the protector. And I'm not just talking with your muscles. I'm talking, you need to know how to protect her from some of her own friends or some of your friends. You got to know how to protect her from what might come into her mind. You got to do that, mister. That's your job. You got to know how to provide for her. You got to know that. You got to know how to live below your means so she can enjoy all that God has in store for both of you. Let's move on. Uh, you got to be motivated by love and serving others. I, I, I don't know how else to say this. Ladies and gentlemen, the reason you get married is to serve that person, which is why you never have a right to demand that they serve you. The reason you get mad is to serve the person. That's what, that's what God did to you. That's why the gospel is so important. So you now get to serve them. I exist to serve you. I exist to, to be self-giving to you. I exist to be self-sacrificing for you. Can you imagine if both people come to the table and just want to outserve each other? Are you kidding me? All you're doing is like, no, 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 I got this. No, 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 I got it. No, 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 I got it. No, 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 I got it. No, please, honey, can I go first? Can you go first this time? Please, I just want you to go first. Oh, come on. Can I get the opportunity just to serve you, please? Are you kidding me? Last one. You not, nobody will like this. I'm just going to say it, and then we're done. You must love your spouse more than you love your kids. Don't get married. If it's, a, if it's a second marriage, don't get married unless you love your spouse more than you love your kids. Say two more times. If it's a blended family, don't get married unless you can say, I love my spouse more than I love my kids. Here's why. Some of you don't believe this. Here's why. Because when you get married, God says the two shall become one. Here's what that means. God don't see you as two no more. He sees you as one. Which means this affair, this love affair, needs to be greater than the one you have with your kids. But pastor, I love my kids. They're my flesh and blood. Here's what God, God didn't say, you and your kids are one. And by the way, in 18 years, they're going to leave. And all you're going to have is that spouse. But the problem is because you don't trust the spouse, you just marrying, ooh, you just marrying them because you want them to have a daddy. You just don't want to be awkward again when you go to the school play. You don't want to be the only one that don't have no daddy or no mommy there. So you're going to make a mistake, marry the person, and when your daughter or your son disagrees, you're going to side with your daughter. And now you're going to create havoc for generations to come. All because you wanted to look good preferences when you go to the PTA meeting. Oh, because you wanted to look good when you go to the office party and you want a little boo. You got everything else. You got everything else except the girl. And they're looking at you like, what's wrong with you? You weird? And so you got to fix that. So you fix it by making a mistake. Come on, family. It's not what we do. Anyways, I'm done. Here's, let me go. <clears throat> when you see a red light, you see a red light. Here's what you need to know. When you cross it and there's an accident, this is what they don't tell you. There's a lot of married couples that are spending their entire life with first responders around them for the rest of their life. They got pastors every week. They got counselors every week. They got, they got family members, marriage mentors, everybody coming in to try and save them because they ran the marital red light. And then you have another group that you had pre-existing conditions that you didn't even raise up. So now you're getting an accident with a pre-existing back condition. You got a hit, and all of a sudden, now your hip's out of line. So now you have issue upon issue upon issue. So now you got to go in rehab for the rest of your life. They don't tell you about that. The reason you must wait till the green light and ask these questions and use this as a system to evaluate is because you're trying to find out who the heck this person is before you say to God and them, I'm going to love you no matter what. Amen. And if many of us had lessons on this before, Lord knows we wouldn't get married. You know, I just wish one. Father, will you help this body of believers? Will you help every last one of us. Make this for every married couple and no divorce is on. Everyone, everybody who is married, may this
be the person that they spend the rest of their lives with. May their kids see these two together for the rest of their lives. Set the legacy up for them. Allow there to be generational blessings, not generational curses. Help them to fight for their marriage. Every man to fight for his marriage. Every woman to fight for their marriage. I pray for every single person in the house. Will you help every last one of them? Every last one of them. Become the person we're talking about. So that like attract like. They won't even tolerate somebody that's not becoming who you've called us to become. Will you make that a reality in this body of believers, please, God? So that when we leave here, we're, <clears throat> we're trying to become who you've called us to be. We can't wait to see what the future holds. But help us to be wise. So we learn from precepts and not from pain. We pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody say, amen.